Welcome to The Helping Conversation, an exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of facilitating trusting, safe, inclusive, and effective helping conversations with others. Recorded at Rock Vox Recording and Production Podcast Studios in Rochester, New York. Mouth off at Rock Vox. RockVox.com. Having enjoyed a 40-year career facilitating his own authentic brand of The Helping Conversation, your host, executive and recovery coach, Keith Greer. Welcome, everybody. And as always, thank you for taking the time to sit in on this episode of The Helping Conversation. In thinking about uh, the conversation that we're going to have today with our guest, I was thinking back on my, I'm going to say career, my 30, almost 31 year career as a parent. Um, I have a son who will be 31 in September and a daughter who uh, will be turning 30 in August. And I like to think that for the most part, I am a relatively confident person. Um, I have done a lot of work through the years, both, both professionally in terms of professional development and honing my craft, as well as my fair share of therapy uh, to um, work through my stuff. And yet I can, I can sit here today and say the, the quickest route to any sense of vulnerability, of fear, uh, has always been through my role as a parent. That, that is where, boy, if you want to go to that kind of yucky place for me, that scary place for me, um, I can go from looking like a pretty confident dude to, to a mess, I think, like, like many of us in it, when it has to do with our role as parents. It is a hard job, a tremendously difficult job. It is, if not the most complex relational state any human being can exist in, it, it, it's got to be in the top two. I, I can't think of any. Maybe marriage uh, is up there, uh, the person that you spend your life with in terms of the sheer complexity of managing this, this relationship and all of the emotion and psychology that goes with it. And so I was doing a little bit of, of research um, in preparation for our conversation today. And, and so I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts before I introduce our guest. Uh, I found this, this article, like many other articles out there, like what are the, what are the most challenging parenting issues? But, but I liked what was on this. A lot of times these kinds of articles are a lot of fluff, but I thought this had a little bit more depth to it. So the first challenge the author talks about is how to parent the child you have, not the child you wish you had, um, which I thought was wonderful. And I think that is so challenging because I don't know about any of you, but I went into becoming a parent with an idea of what I would love to have for a child, how I would love to be with that child. Um, and then those children came along and the whole plan got messed up because they were each of their own unique individuals um, that didn't exist, especially in terms of how I had envisioned parenting around certain things. It, it just didn't work out. And so the shift was on me, right? The shift is on me to, to, to do and to negotiate because um, our kids just come into the world and they are who they are. Um, another one was how to let your child experience the pain of any kind of natural consequence in their life. Oh my, is that difficult to watch our children be in pain uh, and know that there might be certain situations where that, that pain, uh, especially of the emotional, psychological kind, could be some potential learning. But even how do you manage that? How do you know how much is too much, how much is not enough? It, it, it again, it is just so challenging. I love this one uh, because uh, my son was a strong-willed, challenging kid at times. And I have a number of experiences of carrying him out of the supermarket like a loaf of bread as he was tantruming, um, leaving my full grocery cart behind because it was just not going to work getting us through the uh, through the store that day. And, and so this one was how to face judgment, shame and blame from others, um, which I thought, boy, you know, because I remember the looks. I remember the looks you got from other adults and other parents um, who it's always just so easy to look on. I, I, I do remember lots of comforting looks like I've been there before, brother. Um, but I also remember other kinds of looks. Uh, that were a little bit more on the judgmental side. And how do you manage that and not have that um, really wreck your sense of of parenting and competence as a parent? 
This one I so relate to. Uh, one of the challenges of parenting, coping, coping when your child says, I hate you, mom, or I hate you, dad. So I have this very vivid memory. My wife and I laugh about it to this day because uh, some of you have maybe listened to the podcast uh, know that, that my wife and I adopted both of our children, so they're not genetically ours. Uh, and again, my strong-willed son, somewhere, you know, four, five, somewhere in there, and he was in timeout, was having some challenging moments during the day, and we hear from, it was timeout, place was right at the bottom of our stairs, kind of a landing where he could sit, and we hear, when can I go live with my real parents? Uh, and so, again, how do you, do you have the wherewithal as a parent to cope with those moments, to not be threatened by that, to understand where that comes from, especially within the context of um, a, a child who is fully aware by that age that we are their adoptive parents, not the parents who gave birth to them. And the last one they had in this article, which I don't agree with because I have my own take on this, is, is the challenge of how to let go. And I'm not a very big believer in that statement. Uh, I, for one, again, in almost 31 years of parenting, have not figured out how to let go. I've figured out how to hold on differently as my children have aged and reached different develop and have different developmental needs. But the thought of ever letting go, quote unquote, uh, of my children, it, it's a foreign concept to me. So I wanted to share this last thought because um, I, I so related to this as someone who was a practicing family therapist for many years. This is an article by a woman by the name of Jennifer Kogan, who is a clinical social worker uh, in, uh, in Washington State. As a family systems trained therapist, I always look at each person who comes to me as more than just one individual. Rather, he or she is one person within a family. This is because we don't operate in a vacuum, but instead adapt and respond to one another. When I meet with parents who have concerns about their children, we often wind up solving the problem without the child ever needing to be seen. Why is this? I believe this happens because we bring our experiences from our first family or our family of origin into our current family. Everyone does this. It doesn't have to be seen as a negative as long as we are aware of what we are bringing to the table. For example, if you grew up with an anxious parent who seemed to get overwhelmed easily, you might adapt into someone who likes to take charge and has trouble asking for help. Becoming more conscious of this pattern can help you when your child starts to become more independent. Letting go might be hard, even painful for you, but knowing why you feel the way you can, why you feel that way, excuse me, can help you handle the situation. When I think about my own goals, it's not to feel no anxiety, pain, or sadness. Instead, it is to feel more awake, to notice my feelings, and to know what to do with them when they crop up. This business of being awake and conscious helps us and our kids when we can separate out what we feel from what our ch child feels. This opens a healthy dialogue where children are seen and heard for who they are. It does not mean that there are no limits, just that you notice and validate what your children are feeling. And I love that. And that's going to fit so wonderfully into our conversation today of how we see our children as their own separate beings, separate from us, not little pieces of human flesh that we own somehow or our property, but their own unique uh, entities uh, with their own unique needs and where that sometimes meshes with who we are and where we come from. And at times, maybe makes it a little bit more challenging for us as parents. So let me introduce you to our guest today. And our guest is Rosemary Clark. And here's a little bit of her bio. After burning out at work in therapy, Rose learned that she had had a highly abusive childhood. Her need to push herself so hard was rooted in trying to earn something that seemed out of reach her whole life, feeling her parents' love. When Rose became a mom, it magnified her insecurities and started triggering unshed tears and unexpressed anger. She felt she had two choices, fall into the abyss of repeating what her parents did or learn completely new ways of relating. Rose will forever be grateful that she stumbled upon language of listening, a parenting model that not only allowed her to become a mom, become the mom she always wanted to be but also allowed her to reparent herself 
now as an authorized language of listening coach. She specializes in helping moms who had difficult childhoods and gets them to a place where they love the way they parent. Please join me in welcoming into the Helping Conversation, Rosemary Clark. How are you, Rosemary? I am doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited about this conversation. It is near and dear to my heart on so many different levels. So uh, I, I, I told our audience a little bit about who you are, but fill us in maybe a little bit more of, of what your journey has been that has resulted in you now doing this kind of work um, with moms and parents. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I did have an abusive childhood and I didn't know it until I was in therapy at the age of as 34, I believe I was. And um I, but I did know, you know, that I wanted things to be different for my kids. I wanted to parent differently than the way that I had been parented. I even talked to my husband about it before we got married. I said, I want, this is what I want for parenting for our kids. You know, are you on board? I said, I want my kids to be able, our kids to be able to be their own person with their own thoughts and feelings and opinions. And I want them to have a close emotional attachment with their parents. And he was hundred percent on board. And that was fantastic. And then when I had two under two and the yelling started, I knew there was something desperately wrong. De- Desperately, desperately wrong. And I went to my husband again and I'm like, look, I need some tools. You know, these ideas are great, but I need tools. And I don't even know if the tools that I want, you know, exist, you know, the way that I want to parent the mom that I want to be. And like it says in my bio, you know, I'll forever be grateful that I stumbled on on language of listening. I actually stumbled on one of the language of listening coaches without knowing she had had the training. I just loved the way that she spoke about her daughter. She has two daughters. I have two daughters. And I thought, I want my brain to work that way. I want to think those kinds of thoughts about my daughters the way that she does, you know? And then one day she mentioned Sandra Blackard and I went to to Sandy's website, this language of listening website. And I was blown away because there it was, you know, the big struggle that I was having that so many parents have today, which is, you know, we're trying to be, we're trying to validate our kids. We're trying to make their emotions, you know, A-OK and acceptable and all those things. Um, but then, you know, we flip flat, flip flop back and forth because at the same time, you have to be able to hold boundaries. You have to be the one in charge, create safety for the child, right? Help them to know how to show up in the world as their authentic self, but also in ways that are going to benefit them, you know, socially. And, and this is what the model had. It talks about drawing out, coaching out the strengths in the children. Um, you know, through helping them to experience success, which allows the parent to experience success too. And the other half of success, which I felt very strongly was like, you know, no, you can't hit your sister. Yes, we have to get out the door at a certain time, you know, those kinds of things. Whereas all the other blog posts and books and things I was reading was really not helping me know how to hold boundaries and know how to hold boundaries in a way that looked different. Because at this stage in my parenting life, um, I, I believed boundaries were mean and controlling. That's the way I experienced them my whole life previous. And so I became a mean and controlling person when my boundaries were so far across that I couldn't handle trying to be patient anymore. Um, and I would just blow up and it was, it was, it felt out of control. So you, you, you beat me to it. I was about to ask you a little bit if you could, if you could share just a little for our listeners prior to finding this program and doing this, this, this work, what were some of the ways you were parenting that as you look back on it, you say, boy, I, I just knew that isn't how I wanted to be. Yeah. So I was using a lot of praise for one, because I was trying to do what most parents are doing today and and build up a confidence in their children. So I was using a lot of praise. And then there was that flip flop where if something threw me off, you know, my nervous system was constantly engaged as a parent. And I think, um, you know, you talked about fear a little bit at the beginning. And I think so many of us are parenting from a place of fear, even wanting that child to be the person that you want them to be is really just coming from a place of fear, right? Like I want my child to be a certain way so I don't get those judgmental looks. So I do feel good about myself. That's a lot of pressure for a little person to carry. It's also a lot of pressure for you to carry, Yes. to be so worried about what other people think. But again, because of the reward and punishment model that most of us were parented with, this is the way that we function is with this outside picture, this outside constantly looking for how can I prevent bad things from happening? Whereas again, you know, with language of listening, it's this idea of my strengths live inside of myself, who I am, you know, is strong enough to withstand any environment right, that I'm right. in. So here I was, you know, I had literally babies, um, you know, and I was ending up yelling at them constantly. And the end of the day, they'd be laying in bed asleep, looking like the most 
sweet, beautiful little <laughs> angels. And I would just be sitting there in so much regret and so much mom guilt saying like, how can I act like that all day? You know, I was just broken at night. I couldn't sleep because I'd be thinking about, you know, like trying to solve this problem. But again, I didn't have the tools and my thoughts and my ideas. They weren't coming up with what I needed because those possibilities just did not exist within the way my brain was wired right. from the experiences I'd had that thus far in my life. And so it was constantly trying to be the loving, caring mom, um, having all the patience in the world until I would blow up and I would blow up numerous times day just just yell at them right you know and and i remember like i can think of you know those times when they would just jerk and see that pain in their eyes and even to think about it now it makes me feel so uncomfortable yeah because that was exactly what i was trying to not do right 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 yeah yeah uh, you know what strikes me is is and, and of course at the end of the day we want to be incredibly thoughtful about how parents behavior impacts their children but what really strikes me is the is how you describe what the cost and the toll was on you of, of being aware on some level, this isn't who I want to be with my children, not knowing exactly what not being that way would look like or sound like, but very clear that this isn't who I want to be. You got it. Yeah. 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 That is a difficult way to end the day every day. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it really was. Yeah. 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 So fill us in a little bit. Uh, you, so you come upon this language of love. Uh, and, and so start sharing a little bit with us about what it is and, and what are some of the concepts that, that ground this idea about how to be at a different and better place as a parent. Yeah, well, I can start off by kind of speaking about the founder's experience, mm -hmm. you know, so when she had two young, there we go again, two young girls, and um, her her oldest child was just about to start school, and, and she had been a very independent child, and all of a sudden, she was just latching onto her mother's leg all the time, you know, and, and Sandy was just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Luckily enough, Sandy lived quite close to Dr. Gary Landreth, close enough that she could work with him. Now, Dr. Landreth is, uh, was the, um, the head of the, uh, play therapy association in the United States. Mm. And he has uh, a therapy. It's called child parent relationship therapy. And it's a very powerful therapy, which teaches parents essentially how to have therapeutic playtimes with their kids. And Sandy actually ended up writing the first edition of his book of his, of his guide for how to bring this, not just to therapists who were teaching this, but to bring it to, you know, the greater population because Sandy had this fantastic way of distilling down what he was teaching and she pulled in needs based, you know, um, uh, pieces and positive psychology, transformational coaching, you know, she pulled these different pieces in and she simplified it for moms. Cause like when we're, I mean, and for dads really, right. When, as parents we're in these hot, you know, situations where things are kind of crazy with our kids, we can't just think through, you know, uh, you know, pages and pages of books. So she was able to distill the, the model down to, um, there are four premises, but there are three premises that are connected each to their own tool. So there's three tools that we use uh, in the in language of listening and with the beliefs to go with them. And I feel like it's so beautiful because we really do need to change the way our brain works in right. order to change our parenting. And in order to make those beliefs, those new premises, those new beliefs become like our default, the default way that we react to kids, we have to practice those beliefs. And so Sandy gives us these super simple tools to help us practice the beliefs. So I'd love to talk about like each belief Please. with each tool of that. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the first, uh, the first premise of language of listening says that everything children do and say is communication and they must continue to communicate until they are heard. So this very much comes from this child parent relationship therapy and um, really gets the parent really speaking the child's language, understanding the child's language. We can't pull our kids into our future past fearful thinking, right? They just don't function that way. They live in the here and now. And so using this first tool that gets us to understand that everything they do and say is communication and to, like to get that communication, to get it through, that means the child can move on from the behavior generally, or we can help them to move on from the behavior. This is why we see the same behavior showing up over and over right. again. Right. We think we got it handled and it keeps showing up is because there's that underlying communication that we're not catching. So that first tool that goes with that is very simply called say what you see, where you get into the present moment, you get present with that child and you reflect back to them. Anything you see them saying, doing, thinking or feeling. And again, just to get really, really present with them, we remove all judgment 
you know, we say uh, with language of listening, we say what you see, it's in through the eyes and out through the mouth. We skip the brain. We don't add any extra thoughts or judgment. <laughs> and we just say what's going on in front of us. So that's the first step. That's the first step. And this is when anytime you want to connect with your child or anytime you want to give them guidance, you start with the say what you see tool. And then we go in one of two directions. Either you're seeing behavior that you like or you're seeing behavior that you don't like. So when you're seeing behavior like, we move into the strengths tool, which is our replacement for praise. So again, I mentioned before, parents are trying to do the very best that they can to build up their children's confidence by praising them. And unfortunately, when we use praise, which looks like good girl, good boy, yeah. that makes me so happy when you do that. You know, what it does is it kind of grows just one strength in the child, which is people pleasing. Right. I'm very good at making other people happy, right. you know? And again, that's that outside, looking for that outside validation to know that you're good enough. What we want to do is get that child rooted and grounded in their um, beliefs of who they are, you know, and recognize who they are. So again, we use the say what you see tool first, and this grounds the child in real world, world proof. You did this thing, right? And then we say that shows you X, Y, Z. We name the strength. So just to give you a very quick example, when I first used, started using the tools, I decided to pick one strength to notice in my youngest, who was three at the time, I picked one strength to focus on for one day with her. Uh, and w w the strength I picked was helpful. And so I asked her to get me a butter knife from the kitchen and she did. It. So I did, you say what you see, you brought me a butter knife when I asked, and then I named the strength that shows you're helpful. Very simple like that. So I, I, I named the strength two more times that day. And after the third time I said it, she said, mommy, you keep saying that. And I said, yeah, it's just something I'm noticing in particular about you today that you're helpful. You know, the fourth time that day that I named the strength helpful to her. She's three now, remember. She dragged a chair across the kitchen floor to the <laughs> sink. And she said, Mama, when you're sick, I'm going to help. And I'm going to help right now by washing the dishes. And she turned the water on. And so didn't I get my little self over there and, you know, put the plug in and just kind of see her through that. Right. But she's almost nine now. She's turning nine in a matter of days. Um, and that girl to this day still sees herself as helpful. Yeah. She loves to hop up and she'll get water for people at dinner if not everybody has a drink, you know, or a spoon for somebody, even, even without anybody asking her. You know, because she knows that that's who she is. And kids are so, they're so much fun because once you start naming the strengths, they, they love to experience themselves right. within their strengths. And so they'll practice them over and over again. And the premise that goes with that tool says that children have every possible inner strength and they act according to who they believe they are. Mm. So we can even sometimes actually hold boundaries with this tool because, you know, you change the way that they believe in themselves, the way right. that they see themselves right. and you can change a behavior right. very quickly. So I'll tell another story about that too. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hidden, so when I found a hidden strength in my daughter, that's one of the, the categories of strengths that we look for, um, with language and listenings. And so, uh, I have a rule. I have two rules in my house about Sharpie markers because I was finding Sharpie written on my walls and on my furniture. And, um, this st story takes place with the same child, but she's four now. She found a Sharpie marker behind the dining room cabinet. And one of my rules is when a child finds a Sharpie marker, they must bring it to an adult. So she finds this Sharpie marker. She's very excited, big smile on her face. And she's walking towards me, holding the Sharpie marker out. And then at the last minute, her facial expression completely changes. Her eyes get all squinty. And she holds that Sharpie marker up against her chest with her other hand covering it. And she's looking at me like, you know, and my parent brain goes, oh my gosh, what do I do? Right. I go into that fearful future mode that, that thinking that all parents do. Right. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's she going to do with that marker? Right. What's she going to do next time she finds one when I don't know that she has it? Is she going to, you know, mark it on the furniture? How can I get it from her? Do I have to send her to her room? Do I have to pull it out of her hands? What am I going to do? And I just thought, no, wait, what does language of listening? tells me tell me you know and I thought okay say what you see hidden strength so I said what I saw you found a sharpie marker and you started giving it to me and then I said that shows you know how to follow the rules now I know she wasn't following the rules in right. that moment but she was showing me that she did know how yes and I tell you the minute those words were out of my mouth the second they were out of my mouth her facial expression right back to a smile a sharpie marker was handed right out to me and from that day forward it was a game for her to find a sharpie marker and bring it to me because she loved experiencing herself as someone who knows how to follow the rules right behavior changed done right right, right. you know it's fascinating because as you talk about this you 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 do get the sense that children want to be successful they want to be in a positive relationship with their their primary caregivers. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about this in all my years of working with students, you know, many of whom were struggling in, in 
you know, the, your pretty typical public ed setting. And they can look so like they are not interested in being successful until you sit and have conversations with them. And they're dying, literally, sometimes to be successful. They just want someone to show them how. Yeah. That's right. it. Same with our kids. They just, they just need us to coach them and show them how to be successful at staying inside our boundaries and meeting their needs in a way that feels satisfying right. for them. Right. Very simply. Yeah. <gasps> so you said two yeah. things I want to come back to because I, 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 they make total sense to me. And yet we know these, these can be challenging challenging mindsets to hold on to. So the first thing you said is, is you know, where you say, um, say what you see, you talked about our need to be present. And boy, is that difficult for most of us human beings, uh, especially when we're, we're busy and we're stressed and the two kids are running all over the place and I've got to get out the door. And yet it, it sounds like that is the, almost the foundational piece of everything else you're talking about and are probably going to talk about is our need as parents to be present, not in the past, not in the future, present. If we want to communicate with our children. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the most beautiful things about this model, Keith, is that if the tools are not working with your children or if it feels difficult to use them with your children, you use them them with yourself first. Mm. You do say what you see for yourself. You get in the bathroom, you close the door, you look at yourself in the mirror and you talk about to yourself using the word you, right? You're feeling so frustrated right now. You've asked them to put their shoes on 10 times and they're still running around and there's no shoes on their feet and you are pissed. Yeah. You know, like this is you, you, you validate yourself first because when we can validate our children, when we can validate ourselves, we start to understand that we are not the problem. Right. Right. Because what we do is we try to solve the problem of us or we try to solve the problem of the child or the child is trying to solve the problem of themselves. I always say people can't be problems. They can only have problems. Right. So if people can't be problems and we're trying to solve the problem of ourselves, we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist and our tires end up spinning and we just get stuck there. But when we can do that validation in a very clear way, in a way that lands, you know, then the person really understands I'm not the problem. And then right. that opens us up to be ready to solve the real problem. And if we're not problem, then we must have some capabilities. We right. must have some ability to solve the problems, the right. actual problems that are in right. front of us. Right. And that's really the beauty of the tool. When you really get, when you really master it, um, you know, that's, that's what, that's when it really, really works yeah. well. And so again, you can use the tools with yourself. The other piece of that is you're saying like, if sometimes, like you said, you just, sometimes you had to pick up your son and leave the store. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I've literally sat on the floor with my child when they're tangerine at the grocery store, mm -hmm. not caring about what other people thought, you know, I just, I just decided to, this was more important to me than what other people thought. And right. again, that's not always easy for people back to the, say what you see for you, if that's how you're feeling, you know, um, but sometimes you do just need to pick up the child. Sometimes you need what's called an intervention. Okay. So if the child is hurting somebody else or damaging something, right, somebody else, okay. we don't stop for say what you see, right? Yeah, <laughs> right? right. We just jump in there and don't, we don't let them continue uh, experience themselves as failing in that moment. Right. Right. So if they keep hitting your brother, if they're running around the parking lot, they cannot stay within our boundaries of holding our hand. We don't just stand there and try to shout out, say what you see from across the parking lot. We <laughs> scoop that child up. But again, when we can have this mindset of everything they do and say is communication, yes. even when they're scooping them up without not without yeah. saying anything, we're going to scoop them up very differently than we would if we were like, right. oh my gosh, right. like this child is, you know, we're freaking out because we're coming from a place of fear, which again gets rooted in our brains yeah. from, from yeah. the way that we're raised yeah. in our childhood. Yeah, that piece is, that, that is huge. If I, if I view all of my children's behavior as a form of communication, then that completely takes out of there, my children's behavior is a sign of me as an inadequate parent. Oh, it yeah. completely replaces that horrendous thought, which takes us parents yeah. nowhere uh, yeah. and, and puts in, well, it's just, it's just the way they're communicating. The other thing you said that, that, that I love, and boy, you know, I'm thinking back over all my years of parenting when the kids were little and and, you know, I know the number of times this came out of my mouth is the whole thing about I'm proud of you. Um, and I love what you say that because when you really think about that, first of all, what I have come to believe right now is if, if I say I'm proud of you, I'm making it about me, not about my child. Um, but the other piece you mentioned is, is, is we end up creating people pleasers, that that becomes their primary motivation. And that, that is not what we want. No, it's not. Yeah. 
it makes it can make things feel easier for us as parents. No make question. it feel easier, um, but it really isn't. In the end, when we use you know the strengths tool to really um, ground the child in in their understanding of themselves, right? Um, right. You know, you're still going to be happy. It's yeah. just it becomes a bonus. Um, a bo- it becomes a bonus rather than the goal. You right. know, you're still going to get it. I know you are. Right. Because <laughs> we're going to love our kids who as they are. We right. really are when we can drop all that fear that comes. Yeah. 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 I think I mentioned to you when you, when you and I spoke, um, in preparation for today, I do this exercise with, with almost all of my clients and in, in my years of doing school social work, I did this with just about every kid I worked with, which is to ask people to create a list of strengths, talents, skills, positive attributes, positive characteristics. And I have no research to support this next piece of the assignment. It's just a silly thing I came up with, but I challenged people to come up with a list with as many items on it as they are old. And it was always fascinating doing this with high school kids because, you know, you're talking 14, 15, 16. And I can't think of any kid who was able to come up with a list with 13, 14, 15 items on it. It's usually like three or four, and then they don't know what to say. And so you realize when, you, you know, when you're in that conversation, in, in my case, for many years with teenagers, that that's some, we're just not doing a really good job somewhere. And I say the, you know, the grand we culture, society, whatever yeah. Yeah. of helping children leave childhood, knowing exactly what their strengths and really positive characteristics are that become tools in their toolbox to, to cope with life on a day in and day out basis. They just don't know. Yeah. The way that I like to talk about it is I like to talk about a pump, you know, as if we're meant to have this fountain inside of us that Mm. whenever we feel this thirst of the question, am I good enough? You know, where's my value and worth that we're not walking around with an empty cup to other people asking for that question to be answered because that's when we start giving up who we are. right? Right. We try to mold ourselves to what other people want. If that fountain is working well in us, then we can just go and fill our cup from our interior fountain and we're good to go, you know, but, but the parent's job is to prime that pump is to pour in that little bit of water Mm. to get that pump able to function right by reflecting back to the child you know their goodness their strengths who they are yeah and if we're not able to do that then our child is not going to have a a fountain that functions very well and i think many of us as adults are functioning that way that our parents just they tried our parents tried their very very best they did the best with what they had but they didn't prime those pumps and the fantastic news is is that we can prime those pumps ourselves those pumps of self-belief and especially when you can do it for yourself that's when you're super pro at doing it for yeah. your kids as well. Well, I was just about to ask that because I would imagine if, if I am a, a, an adult and a parent who doesn't know what my own strengths and, and attributes are, that's got to be a pretty challenging conversation to attempt to facilitate with my kid. But if, if we're working on that, say, that strength list together, yeah. then, then it, it's probably a much more fruitful conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to believe it for yourself Yes, in order to believe that anybody else, especially your own child, yeah. Yeah. has those abilities. All yeah. right. So you shared, say what you see. Uh, and then you said name a strength, and, but you said there's a third. Yeah. Yeah. So the strengths, again, they go when you see behavior that you like. That's when right. you use the strengths tool. And the other side of that, of course, is when you see behavior you don't like. And this, where, this is where all parents kind of have the big question, right? What do I do when my child's doing something I've told them not to do? You know, I've asked them to stop or how do I even tell them how to stop, you know? And so this tool is called the can do's tool where we just let the child know what they can do right? When they're doing something that, um, that we don't like. I mean, simply that's what it comes down to. Your likes and dislikes are actually your boundaries. So many parents don't even know what their boundaries are. Right. Guys, it's simply what you like and what you don't like. That's what makes up your boundaries. And so when your child is doing something that you don't like, that's when you can step in. But if you don't know what your boundaries are, if you don't even know how to be clear on your boundaries, then you're really going to struggle. So that's, that's one of the things. First thing I get my clients to do actually is to sit down for about 30 minutes and write a little list of everything they can think of that they like and everything that they can think of that they dislike so that they can rewire their brain to start making that be the way their brain works. You know, we all have a filter in our brain that, that, that filters out a lot of the information, the information that our brain has come to understand is unimportant to us. Right. And many times that's our boundaries. Many times that's our likes and dislikes. Like they've been made unimportant. And what many of us did again, being raised with the rewards and punishment model is that we got really good at knowing what our parents and our teachers liked and disliked. 
And so those are the likes and dislikes that when our brain filters out information, we're like, well, my parents would like this. They wouldn't like that, right? Because we're trying to prevent punishment from happening. Uh, and so we've set kind of ourselves aside. We've set our connection to our boundaries aside. So this is the first activity, again, that I get um, the moms to do that I work with is I get them to really reconnect with their likes and dislikes and start to make those things priorities. And the beautiful thing that happens then is they can allow their children to have their own likes and dislikes and have their children make their own likes and dislikes a priority. And even in my marriage, you know, enmeshment in my marriage just dropped crazily. Right. Just a, a, a fantastic amount because I started to recognize I have my own likes and dislikes. My husband has his own. And all of a sudden we could be really two separate people instead of enmeshed. And then we were able to become closer. My husband says. Oh. So the can do's tool back to that. The premise that goes with this uh, tool is a really, really important one. I think first it says that all behaviors are driven by three healthy needs, experience, connection and power. Okay, and what that, that first part of the premise tells us is that you can always trust in, in good intentions. You can always, always trust that your child has good intentions. They're just trying to get a need met, which is what we do as humans. We meet our needs for growth because we always need to grow and expand and learn and all those things, right? And so you can always trust that your child has good intentions, but it doesn't mean that you always like the behavior. You don't always like the way the child is meeting the need. So we redirect them in language of listening and help them problem solve to find a way to meet the need that we both like. And when I say we both like, I mean myself and my child, right? It has to be a way for the child to meet their need that actually feels satisfying for them. Right. Simply it does. It has to feel satisfying. If you're looking to get your need for connection met uh, physically, and I'm telling you, no, we're just going to talk. It's just not going to work, right? So it has to be, it has to be a way that works for, for both. Um, parent and child. Um, and so, yes, it has, to, it has to be satisfying for the child, but then also it has to fall within my boundaries. That's why, that's where I like the way the child is meeting their needs. So it has to fall within my boundaries. So again, back to the fact that we can always trust their good intentions, right? And we can always trust that they have good intentions. Then it really it takes away a lot of the, the troubling thoughts, a lot of the fears and stuff that we have. And again, it's so much easier to redirect them. It's so much easier to get present with them, to get on their side, you know, to be connected with them and they're ready to allow us to, um, to, to coach them through really, um, how to get that need met in a way that falls within our boundaries, right? right? We get to be the one in charge. The second half of that premise says that children are already meeting their needs, which means it's not our responsibility as parents to meet our children's needs for growth. It's just not, they're going to do it. It's our job to create that box of boundaries to keep them safe and to help them function well in the world. But they're going to they're going to meet their boundaries however they like, however they need to. Uh, they're going to meet their needs uh, inside our boundaries, however they need to. So that's really important to know, too, because a lot of parents, I think, that are trying to do this gentle parenting thing, we're getting exhausted. I started out doing attachment parenting. That was like my way of wanting to reverse all the things that were done to me. And it was great in a lot of ways. Um, because I wasn't doing the whole like, oh, you know, your baby's just trying to ma manipulate you you know, so let them right. cry, you know, all that sort of thing. Like I didn't like that stuff and attachment parenting kind of gave me some resources and things to, to start to reverse it and change my, the way that my brain was wired. But I just started to disappear. Mm. I completely started to disappear and it gets exhausting when you think that it's your job to meet all your child's needs. It's not. Our yeah. children are meeting their needs all the time. And right. actually, they need to, to come up with strategies to meet their needs on their own right. so that they can be right. self-sufficient, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Our, 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 I sometimes think our primary job as parents is to, well, I always think about roots and wings, right? Is to have them grounded in, in, in connected to their family, but really ready to march off into, into the world as, as full fledged, competent adults, right? Being able to take care of themselves. Yeah. Cause they can have both. Yes. And we want them to have both. Right. It's not one or the other, right? right. It's not one or the other. Right. Both is, is what the ideal is. So I, I, I have a question bouncing around inside my head as I'm listening to this, these thoughts on how to parent. And obviously, I would assume the sooner we do this kind of work, the sooner maybe we, we adhere to, um, to this kind of model of parenting, the sooner in terms of the age of our children, the, the better for our children, the better for us. 
But I'm wondering what your experience has been, Rosemary, in your work or in the work of the folks who have created this model when a parent maybe all of a sudden says when their child is 16, I, I, I've got to do this different, or their child is 26, and oh my, I read this book and this just resonates with me and I need to start doing this differently. I, I want to assume, while maybe more difficult, more more complex, the, the older the child is, the more history there is between parent and child, this is all still relevant no matter when a parent might decide I'm going to, I need to do a shift in my, my parenting. You got it. It's never too late. You know, if my mom could learn language of listening today <laughs> and change, you yeah. know, the way that she sees herself first yeah. and then the way that she sees her children. Oh my goodness. My heart would be so full. You know, yeah. that would be, that would just be an incredible gift um, to my whole family, the family, my family of origin, you know? Um, but, but yes, I've had clients who have teenage children. I have clients who have a, a, adult children and it's, it's just been beautiful to see, um, you know, what's possible. And typically, you know, we can talk about teens, you know, when it comes to kind of change things up with teens and, and adult children, I tell people, you know what, you just kind of start with the strengths tool. Yeah. Right. Because the way that we see our children informs the way that we, that we treat them. And not only when we use the strengths tool, that's not only does it change our children's, our child's view of themselves, it changes our view of our child. Right. Um, and so then we, we will treat them differently because parenting is a lot about parenting. That's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're so sure that you have a disrespectful, lazy, you know, disobedient child in your hands, that's exactly what you've oh, got. That's my what friend. Got. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And when we start looking for strengths and in particular hidden strengths, like I talked about with the Sharpie story, right. um, you know, it really, it really shows the child what's possible for them. It sh shows them what they can live up to. And it shows them that we believe in them for a child to believe in themselves or them to see their strengths. We really, really have to see them first and prime that pump. Got to get that prime, that pump primed for them. Right. But I tell you, I, I actually have a course that's specifically for teaching the strengths tool, actually, um, because it's so powerful. And what I've experienced and what, what the people that have taken this course has, have experienced is more hugs, which mm. is kind of weird to just say, like, you're going to get more hugs. And it even says this on the front of Sandy's book, which talks about the model called Say What You See. So Say What You See by Sandra Blackard. It says more respect, more hugs. The more hugs piece, I'm telling you, it comes from the strengths tool. Because I think what it does is it just feeds that child's connection with you yeah, so deeply right. and their self-belief at the same time that they can't help but express it physically with their body. Yeah. Like they just have to express this deep connection and joy, joy at experiencing themselves as competent, as capable, as yeah. being seen as somebody who's competent and capable. Yeah. And it's just, it's just a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah you know, it strikes me that, that, that. So if I come at my child with what's not working, right, when just highlighting, you know, the, the behavior I don't like, that's a vulnerable making conversation, but it's a vulnerable making conversation that creates distance versus coming at my child with, here's what I like, here's what I see, here's the strengths I see. I would make the argument that that's also a vulnerable making conversation, but it's a vulnerable making conversation that drives connection. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Much more productive. It's got to feel better all the way around. So again, I'm, I'm sitting here. Yeah. I, I'm sitting here. You got it all the way around. I, I'm sitting here thinking about, uh, about, you know, one of the populations I do a lot of work with, which are uh, families um, who are struggling often with an adult child who is, has a long history of struggling with substance use disorder. And, and there is, you know, there can be a 10, 15, 20 year history of just this, I call it a dance, this stuckness of their interaction, which is always negative, always judgmental, always angry, always full of hurt, always immediately puts people in fight flight the minute they come into a room and even attempt to talk about this. And how different this could be if we could, even in, in those situations, help parents say what you see highlight strengths, yeah. right? That, that, cause that, that becomes so hard over many, many years of voicing concern around your, your adult child substance use. Yeah. And I bet it feels practically impossible to people yes. and if they could use the language of listening tools with themselves first. Yeah. Because it's okay how they feel. It's okay that they feel, you know, disoriented and disheartened and they feel angry and all the feelings that are coming. None of those 
none of those emotions are a problem. They're actually helping that person adapt. Right. And they're only about the parent themselves. They're actually not about the child and they're not about the child's behavior, right. which would be very difficult for most of us to really understand. But like, even, you know, in interactions in my marriage, um, you know, anger is typically an emotion that we all kind of struggle with and yeah. what's okay to do. Do we hide it? Do yeah. we blow up? What happens? You know, my husband and I came from very different families and his family, it was, you hide the anger. Right. And in my family, it's like anger is the only, it's the only one that's okay. The only emotion that's okay <laughs> to express, you know? And so it's like, this is very different place. And so if I experience anger and I'm a lot louder than he would ever be, you know, um, he, he will feel like my anger is about him. And I'm like, I need my anger to be mine. Right. I need it to be mine so I can have it and I can use it to adapt to the situation that I'm in to recognize that my boundaries are being trampled and I want to try to do it in a way that doesn't make anybody in the family feel scared. You know, I don't want to be yelling at people and upsetting them. Um, for sure. But it's, I need my anger to not mean anything about anybody yeah. else in my yeah. family, because then I feel like I have to hide it and right. and whatnot. Really, it's just, it's me. I don't like what's happening. And I feel very strong in those yeah. moments that I really, really don't like. And it's just my brain trying to get me to act right. on my boundaries. Right. I mean, that's simply it, you know? Right. And so that needs to be okay, of course, for these parents to be angry. But like you say, like if they can come at that child, and again, you usually have to work on yourself first and then you can come to that child and say, here's what's working. Yeah. Here's where I see, you know, the things that are really, and, and not, it's not even really that I see. Here's what you're doing and here's what strength it shows you have. It has right. to completely be about the other person when yes. you're naming the strength. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. right. Um, but again, when the parent does that, we just have this powerful ability over our children, um, you know, that the message gets through so much more deeply yeah. when it comes from us. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to back up and ask a couple of other questions more specifically about you and your work as a coach. Um, so you could have done all of this work and, and had all of this wonderful outcome for you as an individual and for you as a mom and still not chosen to go into coaching. So I, I'm a very big believer, us mm -hmm. folks in the helping world, it is not a coincidence we're in the helping world. So if, if I had known you when you were a kid, a teenager, what were you about then? What were you involved in that maybe even then, maybe even before you ever thought of it this way, was some evidence that you were destined to work in the helping world? Yeah, well, I think I think it would just be the fact that I was always drawn to children. I was always drawn mm. to younger children. You know, the first real job that I had, I wanted to earn money so I could go to university. My parents had six kids. They weren't going to pay for a university education for all of us. Um, so we needed to contribute uh, to that. And, you know, I went to McDonald's for an interview. They were only taking people that would work overnight, you know, all these things. And I was, I remember I was looking in teen magazine and they were like, um, you can start a daycare at your house, a summer daycare. And so that's what I did wow. I, when I was in just finished grade nine. Uh, I started the summer daycare. Thankfully my, my mom was open to that and, um, yeah, started the summer daycare and started offering it for, you know, a fantastic price for parents, but I was making a, a pretty penny doing this and, and just working with kids, you know? And so that, that was, that was the start. And, um, and I continued to work with, um, kids in, in different, uh, in different ways. I, I actually have a degree in opera singing. That's what I studied when I did wow. go to university. And so I started teaching music lessons for, um, for quite some time. Yeah. And then I worked as a youth minister with teenagers and really spent, uh, you know, about 10 years of my life, um, working with young people and what drove it, what absolutely drove what I wanted to pass on to these teenagers was I wanted them to understand their value and worth because I knew if it could get grounded in them before they became ad adults, that would just help them with life so much. Um, you know, so that, that was really like my drive during that time. Like I had my chance to work with teens and that's, that's the message I really wanted them to get. And, um, so I, when I finished that work and, and, um, you know, after I was married and, and had kids, um, then it really became about my own children and just wanting things to be different, to be different for them, yeah. you know? And then even now though, there's a part of me that I still think about the children, right? Like, I'm very, uh, did, you know, uh, quite a bit of reading around the ACEs study, the adverse childhood right. experiences yep. study. Um, I was led, I was led to that. And, um, you know, I just really want to reduce the, uh, uh, the occurrence of ACEs in this yeah. world. I'd really, yeah. really love to be a part of that. And of course, as you said, you work with the parents to do that, but it's not just that, you know, like I, I, I think about the children and that's huge for me, but I also think about, and maybe this sounds a little um, intense or whatever, but I often think about the moms and their experience and how much it hurts. Like yeah. I felt so hurt inside myself. Like I was hurting myself when I was treating my children this way. 
but I also felt like it was the little girl in me that needed me to show up for my children. So I, I, I even think about like the little girl and the moms, you yes. know, and I think about their experience of motherhood. I want moms to enjoy motherhood. I want their experience to be a wonderful one. And I want ch- kids to enjoy their childhood, you know, so it all kind of led it up from just, you know, I had two younger siblings. I loved pretending to be their mom. Um, I did babysit for a long time and then I had this summer day camp and, and on and on from there. Right. Right. I think that's a, it's a, that's a very challenging concept. I think for many in our society to hold on to, which is obviously at the end of the day, we do not want trauma perpetrated on any child, but, but the concept that I think is challenging for some is to really believe that maybe the parent who is perpetrating the trauma would love to be different too, and just isn't for whatever the complex reasons are. So I know that can be a challenging kind of duality to hold on to, right? That we we don't want bad stuff happening to kids, but our tendency to then look at the parents and just blame and shame and 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 not understand the sheer complexity of family of origin, a family of origin, a family of origin. We miss opportunities. We miss opportunities to maybe make some connections with parents um, because once we're in a shaming and blaming place in, in looking at them as horrible parents, we're done. We're done in terms of any ability to be of support or assistance to them. Yeah, I mean, this is why we call it generational trauma, right? right. And this, it's just the way our brains get, get wired. Like yeah. I said, like when I wanted things to be different, my brain didn't even know what the possibilities were. Yeah. How many times in my, in my language of listening coaches training was I sitting there in the calls and the concepts would just come towards my brain and just whoosh, just go over right. my head, you know, right. because I just, I, it just, the wiring wasn't there. But as I continued to study and learn and hear the examples and use the tools with my children, those brain weight, like those, those mental pathways, I mean, it's a biological, physical thing yeah. that happens, right? Like those, those new um, brain wiring, uh, that new brain wiring, it gets formed. Yeah. Um, and again, that's why I say it's so beautiful that we have the beliefs about children, these, these real truths about, it's really, it's about people. You know, I, yeah. when I, when I use the, when I teach moms how to use the tools with themselves, I say, I change up the premise, the first premise, for example, and I'll say everything you do and say is communication and your heart right. must continue right. to communicate right. until it is heard. Yeah. Right. So get us listening to ourselves first. I mean, it's a beautiful thing that happened. You talked at the beginning too, about how much our personal growth really can get wrapped up in our parenting. Right. You know, that that's, that that's it. Like the, the, the most extreme vulnerability. I mean, who, who feels more powerless than a parent? Oh my. Right. <laughs> right. We get to these points of feeling so powerless because there's this little person that we can't control. That's right. And right. society tells us to control them, all, which all is the also time. a problem, right? You know, it causes, it causes issues. Yeah. Oh, the messages, the messages from society to parents are, they're just astounding sometimes in their stupidity and simplicity and not honoring the complexity of of parenting. You know, I mentioned earlier of, of the work I, you know, I'm, I feel pretty good about that I've done and did over the years and in, 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 on myself and in my parenting. And I think in a lot of ways for me, it was coming into parenting and, and wanting to be a bit of a different father than my father was. And, and I think in a lot of ways, I would like to think in a lot of ways, my children would say I was, yeah. but with all the work I did, there were still those moments where I opened my mouth and my father came out of my mouth saying things I swore I would never say. Like in those moments when you're stressed, not present as, as we talked about earlier. And then you say, okay, all right. Can at the very least, can I at least go back and apologize (laughs) kids? That was not me at my best, but, but it's so hard. It's just so difficult to be, be the parent you want to be 24 seven. It is. That's, that's one of the quotes from Dr. Landreth that I love. And he said, it's not really what you do. It's what you do after what you do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like when you can go back to your child and say, can I have a do over? Yeah. I don't like the way that I spoke to you back there. Here's what I wish. Here's yeah. what I wish yeah. I had said, you know, and, and I mean, imagine showing the child that, you know, adults are human. Parents are human. This is what you do when you make a mistake nobody's infallible, you know, all these things. And then the child has something to model because children do as we do more right. than they do as right. we say. Yeah. 
right? What we model is the most powerful way to, you know, to communicate to them really what our boundaries are and, and how to be a human in the world. Right. And when I said that, it reminded me of some of those, those topics that you brought up at the beginning. Were you going to get me to, to challenge or not to challenge, but to handle any of those topics? Yeah, like for example, so, so I got a couple more you? questions for you before we wind this up. So you have talked about one of the, okay. one of the, okay. the, the cornerstones of this is, is naming strengths. And I love that because I think such a, a foundational piece of all good coaching, regardless of who you coach, is to be strength-based. So I always invite my guests to be strength-based with themselves. So share a little bit about of some of your strengths that you bring to your work. Yeah. You know, I think I love how sensitive I am. Mm. Um, and that I allow myself to feel what other people are feeling. You know, this was one of the things that actually my family kind of attacked when I was young. Oh, Rose is so sensitive. She's too sensitive, you know, and now I've kind of grown and said, I love my sensitivity. I love being able to, to connect with other people. And in particular, my children on a level of sensitivity. And I've always loved seeing the potential in other people. I've always loved kind of just being able to see who, who, what's possible for them and like who they really are. And now that I have language of listening in the strengths tool, I have this simple, simple way of passing it on because of course, Keith, when I'm coaching my clients, what do I do? I use the language of listening tools with them. I model it for them. Right. I point out their strengths. You know, I point out all the things that they're doing right um, so that they can continue um, to expand uh, on their strengths and use their strengths and have self-belief. I mean, I, I really believe that, um, you know, if, if we as parents can just have this unconditional boy, what we could do, um, you know, in, in this society. And I think just really, honestly, I care about people. Yeah. I really do. I care about people. I care about children, but I feel like that includes us all. Sure. And, um, you know, my ability to just to see other people and barely know them and really, you know, give a damn about them, um, right. you know, and, and want really good things for them. Right. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say uh, for you in, in doing this work as a coach, maybe some of just some of the challenges of doing this work? Some of the challenges. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not infallible. I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not even a perfect parent. You know, maybe some people would think that, you know, well, Rose must be, you know, a perfect parent. And uh, I'm certainly not, you know, there are even some, sometimes even now, you know, like you said, sometimes the things that your dad would say would come out of your mouth. Sometimes the things my mom would say, you know, right. will come out of my mouth. So I'm not, I'm not perfect. Um, and so learning to not try to uphold, um, this, this, this picture of perfection, uh, because I feel like that was also a thing that came from my childhood is you have to present this certain vision of yourself, right. um, you know, and so, and so learning who I am authentically and then finding ways to feel safe at yeah. presenting who I am authentically, um, even as a coach, even, even as a helper, you know. Uh, that's, that's, I think, and, and I think it's a very important part of being a helper is right. being authentic and, and, you know, showing, showing, um, you know, that, that you're not perfect. That's, yeah. that's an important yeah. part of it. You know, yeah. we're all just human. Look, I've always, I, I have always argued, and this is especially true working with kids, but I think it does not matter what age. Most of us, when we work with a helping person, we have a really, really good bullshit meter. So if, if we're working with somebody who is not authentic and genuine, we read it. We read it and, and good luck with that conversation. And yet the flip side is true. That authenticity, genuineness, this person is real with me, honest, intimate, vulnerable. Boy, that's, that will take the conversation so far. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, the greatest joy or joys of doing your work. Oh my goodness. Honestly, my favorite thing is when moms come to me and start telling me that the kids are using the tools back. Mm. On mm -hmm. You know, like we do something called centering phrases. We teach the mom centering phrases. And um, for example, I had a client that, that had a three-year-old and she said, my daughter came to me today and she said, it's important to you that, you know, like, cause I had taught her that you say this to your daughter, I say, you know, 
figure out what's important to your child, you know, you know, name that. That's a, a beautiful centering phrase. And imagine a three-year-old coming to their parent and saying, mm -hmm. it's important to you that, or even when I use the tools with my own daughters, you know, it was earlier this summer. Um, I, uh, I use the strength of my daughter, you know, that, that shows you have really good ideas. You know, she's a very creative thinker, you know, and, and she came to me and she gave me a hug. That was the first thing she came over and she gave me a hug and she said, and that shows you're good at parenting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when the kids start using the tools and you see them being, you know, effective, yeah, it just, you know, and like, and, and yeah, so the joy boy in the mom's faces and to see them feeling so successful and so capable. Yeah. Um, you know, and giving them that, um, that belief in themselves that they can do this because it's really their work. It's very, very little of it is my work, yes. really. I'm right. there to support right. them, right. Um, you know, and they do it. They have just such beautiful strengths yeah. and abilities themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but yeah, seeing the kids, hearing stories about the kids using the tools back with their parents, I think is just like, that's, that's the best. That's a wonderful experience. That's the best. It's, it's such a beautiful picture. Of, of parent and child learning together how to do this relationship instead of parent feeling like it's all on them. Like I've got to be the expert because I'm the adult and I parent my kid. I love that vision that now nah, we're in this together from the moment that child takes their first breath and, and we can learn and enhance our skills together as we go along. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. If you are interested in uh, getting in touch with Rose, uh, I will make sure that uh, whatever, whatever platform you are listening to this podcast on, uh, in the podcast notes will be some information on how to contact Rose. Please, please reach out to her. If you are one of those parents who, as Rose described herself a number of years ago, ending every day feeling overwhelmed, knowing on some level I was not who I wanted to be, with my children. Um, it does not have to stay that way. It just doesn't have to stay that way. And, and there's work ahead, no question. Um, but please, please reach out to Rose and, and uh, make some contact with her and get into a conversation with her. Rosemary Clark, thank you so much. I adored this conversation. This was wonderful and insightful uh, and educational and is oh so needed in our world today. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and, and chatting about childhood and parenting. It's such an important conversation. And um, yeah, you're just a wonderful person to have that conversation with. Keith. It was great. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation today. And again, if, if, if this in any way, shape or form resonated with you as a parent, and as we talked about, no matter where you are in your parenting, in terms of the age of your child, and you think a conversation like this would be helpful with Rose, please reach out to her. Uh, we do not have to parent from a place of feeling not good and not confident, and we can be at a very different place. It does take some work to get there, no question, um, but very doable. And Rose would be a wonderful, wonderful coach to work with you. Uh, if that is, uh, if that's one of your goals. So I thank you all for taking the time to sit in with us and to listen to this conversation today with Rosemary Clark. And I invite you to join us for the next episode as we continue to shine a light on the skill and talent of those individuals that invite another into that compassionate, complex, and intimate space called the Helping Conversation. Have a great day, everybody. We thank you for sitting in on our discussion today on just one unique version of The Helping Conversation. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's podcast, so we sincerely invite you to follow, rate, and most importantly, review our episodes. For more information on Keith Greer and this podcast, log on to keithgreercoaching.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue the exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of The Helping Conversation. Thank you.